Well, it'd be great to have your Bibles open. So Jeremiah chapter 29, we're in week six of our series. So if you've got a Bible or a Bible app, it'd be great to have that open and ready. There's an outline on the back of the news as well. So if you have that handy, it'd be good to have that there. There's translation points there in English, Korean, Dinka, and simplified Chinese. So I encourage you to have that in front of you as well. But right now, let's pray and ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, we pray, please would you help us to live faithfully where you have placed us, to seek the welfare of our city and stand firm in the gospel. We pray that as we do that, Lord, that we would trust that you are working out your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I have to tell you that every now and then in the low household, just on the rare occasion... Rules are broken, which means consequences must follow. But when consequences are served for poor life choices, I have to tell you that we witness quite an array of responses by the person who has offended. Uh, Little secret, those different responses are determined by two factors. Okay, so this is a great secret, great little insight. Here you go. So the two factors are this. Uh, your willingness to recognise your wrongdoing and how constructively you engage with the consequence. Okay, so let me tell you the four responses that we witness and you can see if you resonate with any of these in your own home. Uh, The first response is denial. Uh, Denial is when the offender just won't recognise any wrongdoing and then goes on to merrily pretend that there's actually been no consequence at all. That approach doesn't really work, but that's the first response. The second type of response is rebuttal, okay? So this is when the offender won't recognise their wrongdoing and they're going to go down kicking and screaming, actively fighting this unjust consequence that has been served to them. The third approach, withdrawal. The offender recognises their wrongdoing, but they feel so sad about the consequence that they go away and sulk. The fourth response, the offender recognises their wrongdoing and the consequence leads them to change. A change involving a heart that is sorry and a will now committed to doing things differently. That's our fave, okay? (laughs) But sometimes it's quite a journey to get there. By the time we get to Jeremiah chapter 29, God's people are facing the consequence for their wrongdoing. The Lord had warned them through Jeremiah for over two decades, unless they turn from their wicked ways and turn to the Lord, a terrible consequence, judgment, is coming and will be served through the hands of their enemies. But they haven't listened. The leaders and the prophets previously said that everything will be fine. But it wasn't. And even now, having been carried off into exile, the prophets are saying, don't worry, it's just a blip, it will soon be over, but it won't. The response to the exile has been one part denial, failing to recognise their wrongdoing and downplaying the consequence, and one part rebuttal, failing to recognise their wrongdoing and determine that their situation is unjust. They'd sooner believe that God had failed them rather than the actual reality that they have failed God. But this is not a blip, for they will be in exile for 70 years. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you, says the Lord. And this is not unjust, for whilst the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, may have been the one who carried them off into exile from Jerusalem, the Lord says that he was ultimately the one who carried them and banished them. It's going to take them some time to come to repentance. And in the meantime, they've got to figure out how to live faithfully in this foreign land, in Babylon. Now, sometimes living in the Western world is described for Christians as a bit like living in Babylon. Now, really, obviously, there's some ways in which it's not like living in Babylon. So just to name those in case, just in case we missed them. You know, God hasn't exiled us here as a consequence for our sin, exiled us to Toowoomba or something like that. Obviously, we don't face the same sort of persecution for practising our faith that some of God's people did 
here. But in a bigger way, we are living in a foreign land that wants us to conform to a different image, to different values, to different priorities. All Christians, in one sense, as understood in the New Testament, are exiles. We're residents in a foreign land. Residents because we're not tourists, this is our home, but also foreign because we're citizens of another land, of heaven, of God's kingdom, which is yet to come in full. We, like the people in Jeremiah, need to figure out how to live faithfully as exiles. And so in order to help them figure that out, Jeremiah writes them a letter. In fact, he writes them a series of letters. And we read in the first letter, from verse 1, this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets and to the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so in doing so, uh, Jeremiah offers three pieces of advice to the exiles. Uh, Settle down and live faithfully. Seek shalom, participating in God's mission. And stand firm, trusting in God's grace and plans. So settle down, seek shalom, and stand firm. So first, dear exiles, settle down. So verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. So build, plant, eat, marry, increase. This is not some sort of ancient equivalent of, you know, keep calm and carry on. This is, this is not a denial that they're in exile or just making the best of a really bad situation. But God is telling them that they need to settle down. They need to put down roots. Because their time in Babylon will be long-term, not a short stay, will be fruitful, not fruitless. Remember, there were false prophets telling God's people that this exile was just short-term. These were the same prophets who had told God's people that they need not fear the Babylonians. But none of that was true. This isn't a short-term stay. This wasn't an accident. And God's desire for them is not only come to a point of repentance, which we'll come to soon, but also that they would get on with the ordinary rhythms of being God's people. Uh, They just, in many ways, want to hive themselves off and live on the edges, on, on the periphery of Babylon, When we hear and read that language of build, plant, eat, marry, increase, our minds should actually immediately rush back to the creation mandate of the purpose of humanity's presence in the world. And of course, the point here is not that every person should have a a checklist and you go, you know, plant a garden, build a house, get married, have children or something like that. The point is that they shouldn't put all that on, on hold. You can imagine them wanting to do that. Not only because they'd been sold a lie that this would all blow over soon, but also because they might want to wait until things are better. I remembered some years ago now that having the great privilege of sharing dinner one night with Bishop Daniel and Rachel in our home with our kids. And as we shared dinner, they shared some of their experience the experience of being exiled from the homeland. Daniel had spent six years in Ethiopia and then nine years in the Hukuma refugee camp in Kenya. And whilst many things amazed me that night, as they shared so generously with us, one of the extraordinary things that stood out was that in their time as exiles, that Daniel and Rachel met each other, they married, had children, They got on celebrating the joys of Easter and Christmas. The way in which all the ordinary rhythms of being God's people went on as they lived faithfully. Going to exile wouldn't have just felt like a step backwards, but actually would have felt like an undoing. 
like a, a reversal of the creation mandate and, and God's unfolding plans going backwards. They had gone from the land of Babel to the promised land. God had called Abraham to lead God's people out of Babylon and into towards Jerusalem. And so you could imagine them thinking, well, when we get out of here soon, that's when we'll get on with being God's people. They failed to recognize, though, who put them there. So often in our culture, we don't value the impact that our presence can have over time. We often have very short-term mindsets. Staying in long places long-term is often not valued at all in our culture. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that everyone has to stay everywhere long-term. God calls us to new places too. And of course, we should remember that the Israelites didn't have any choice in the matter. But we ought not to underestimate the powerful witness of long presence. Just like the exiles here were not meant to withdraw into some sort of holy huddle until our rescuer arrives, nor are we to simply accommodate and give in to and conform to everything that our culture desires of us, nor are we to just try and dominate and take the world for Jesus and wipe everything else out. No, we, like they, have to figure out how to live faithfully with gospel presence in the ordinariness of life and even amidst a sometimes hostile world. That's not always easy. We see a great example of that in the book of Daniel. Set in this very time of exile, Daniel didn't withdraw or try to dominate or simply accommodate everything in his culture. In fact, he took on various aspects of Babylonian life and culture in his name and education and even employment. But he also had to figure out where to draw the line. In the words of one commentator, he accepted and adapted to where God had put him, but remained faithful to God if an ir irreconcilable conflict of loyalties arose. Now, that's not easy. This year, I've actually, more than ever, had conversations with people, especially about their workplaces, when they've been trying to figure out and wrestle with if they're being asked to do something or sign up to something which actually is in conflict with their core gospel convictions, if this is a, a line for them or not. You know, we can't just withdraw from our culture, but nor can we accommodate every aspect of our culture. It's actually why being embedded in the life of the Christian community is so important. It's why also not underestimating the power of long-time presence is so important. Often when uh, sharing with people from outside of St. Bart's that I've been here uh, 10 years, it's been wonderful to serve on the team here for, for 10 years, uh, often people think, well, we'll say, you must be really trapped, can't you get out of there or something like that. You know, and culturally, we're often so encouraged to move as quickly as we can to the next place, to the next best thing. But sometimes, simply by the virtue of being embedded in a place for a long time, it breaks open the powerful potential of deeper and richer relationships on our front lines. Sometimes it, it nurtures long-term opportunities to show and share the good news in really authentic ways. Sometimes it enables us to have a witness and seek the welfare of our cities in a way which wouldn't be possible in the short. You know, I think we should always have a long-term mindset. Over the years, in different contexts, I've worked with people who always seem tentative with me, you know, like they're holding something back. They're, they're holding something back in their work or in their relationships because actually the heart and the mind is in the future. It's in the, the next thing that they want to get to. And this is just a stepping stone. I've known Christians sometimes as well who are, who are so preoccupied by Jesus' return that they actually never get involved or invest in the life of local Christian community or the world in which God has actually placed them. And we have to be real and recognise that people are quick to see when we are not present. Now, please don't hear me wrong. Of course, there's plenty of reasons why people have to move. God sends us and we have to discern to move. There's plenty of reasons why we are in places for shorter seasons. And of course, presence is just as important in those places. If you are in a season where you're moving or moving through stages of moving, get connected in the life of Christian community and broader community as soon as you can. The point is, wherever we are, for however long that may be, 
We love the place and the people and we have a presence for the God who has put us there. Second, dear exiles, seek shalom. So verse 7. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. The word for peace and prosperity here, and in some translations you might see it as welfare or well-being or something like that, but, but regardless, the original word for those three words, just one word, shalom. It, it's a really expansive word. When you break it open, there's just more and more depth and richness to it. It's not merely the absence of conflict, but the presence of something better. Shalom could and was used in a whole variety of ways, but it always carried a, a deeper connotation of, of wholeness and completion. And so to bring shalom meant to bring all the complex pieces together in order to make it complete, to restore and to make whole. It actually carries this whole sense of it's comprehensive. It means social flourishing and economic flourishing and psychological flourishing, physical flourishing, spiritual flourishing, that there be meaning, justice, hope and wholeness. So just step back for a moment and remember the context because this is really shocking. The Lord wants his people not to hate nor even resent the ones who carried them into exile, but he wants them to actively seek and pray for shalom. God is saying to the exiles, you are missionaries. Shalom is what you bring to where God has placed you. And so we seek shalom as we share the saving good news of Jesus, as we work to reconcile relationships, as we address the needs we see around us, as we care for the vulnerable, as we carry out our work, as we give our resources away, as we nurture others and help them to grow, as we contribute to our communities, as we comfort those in need, as we love our neighbour. And of course, whatever we do is always incomplete. It's always provisional, proximate and partial. But whatever we do, we can do it in the confident knowledge that Jesus, when he returns, will bring it to completion. If you want to try putting this into action this week of what it looks like to, to bring shalom, to seek shalom in, in the circles and context where God has placed you, a good place to start is just think about someone who is difficult in your life, okay? So just pick out someone. Hopefully, hopefully you've got someone difficult in your life, okay? So pick out that person in, in your mind. Yeah, that's where you may start. Uh, begin by praying shalom for them. Intentionally, actively, daily praying for them. You know, one of the side effects is that it will change your heart for them too. The people could have been so tempted just to turn inwardly and hide. But actively seeking the wholeness and well-being of our city begins by looking outwardly with a heart for God's purposes in this place. So I think that's really exciting. So we think about our city and wherever you might be during the week, all of our front lines, that wherever you go, whatever front line might be, we should be considering, how do I bring God's shalom here? Now, that might seem really hard at times, and actually there might have been times when we don't really want to do it for whatever reason. But God is asking his people to do so, even for the ones who carried them into the exile. You know, Paul said... Be the fragrance of Christ. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Don't just love your neighbour, but love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This week, as I've prepared to share on this chapter for us to explore this together, I've really been considering about what does it mean to, more actively for me, shape my prayer life around praying for the shalom of, of our city and so I decided I was going to send a message for a few people and ask their opinion of how uh, should we be praying, what do you see the needs are. So I asked a, a parent, a policeman, a pastor and a politician, okay? I'm not like just excluding everyone else who has a career that doesn't start with P, but there you go, that's what, that's what I did. So I asked these people, how, how should we be praying for our city? What are some best things we should pray for? And this is just a few things that they shared. They said youth crime, 
in, in the complexity of dysfunctional families and the tragedy of the home lives of, of young criminals, as well as the victims who are traumatised. Pray for restoration of families, that families, spouses and relatives would know God's love and treat one another as beloved children of God. Pray for wisdom and priority to care for the most vulnerable. Pray for those who care for the sick, that they would be empowered to assist them to the best of their ability and to show them grace and compassion. Pray for protection and enhancement to our region's environment. Pray for gentle and replenishing rain, for the challenge of drought and how to listen to those who have solutions and how to support those most impacted. Pray for emergency and service workers, that they would be sustained through what is shaping up to be an intense disaster season. Pray that they would be supported, sustained, empowered and resourced to care for the communities, that they would have patience, resilience and grace. Of course, we could go on and on, we're barely scratching the surface. The question is, does the, the shalom of our city, be that your workplace, your home, your communities, the schools, wherever it may be where you engage, does the shalom of those places appear, does it register on your daily prayer list? In God's wisdom, extraordinary wisdom, when it comes to seeking the wholeness of our city, he has put his people in the hot seat, not least through the ministry of prayer. God hears our prayers. God answers our prayers. And we can have this muscular ministry even in contexts in which we think ourselves weak, even in contexts in which we deem that we have no power or influence. Third, dear exiles, stand firm. So let's pick up from verse 8. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So the two key ways in which they can stand firm living in Babylon are to silence deception. And do you note here that the lies are actually coming from within, from their own prophets? So silence deception and return to the Lord. The exiles aren't away from home because God is slow or because God is procrastinating, but because this is how long it's going to take them to express their trust in him. Verse 10. When 70 years are completed... Verse 12, then you will call on me and come and pray to me. Verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me, when you seek me with all your heart. And what will the Lord do? I will listen to you. I will be found by you. I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places I have banished you. I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This language, if it seems for me, it's straight out of Deuteronomy chapter 4, in, in that chapter where God promised that when Israel would turn to the Lord sincerely with heart and soul, that he wouldn't abandon them, he wouldn't destroy them, but he would receive them with forgiving grace. It's not because God's needy, but turning to God is the way we receive his grace. You need to seek God to receive his grace. Which means if you seek God, you will receive his grace. Even after decades of captivity, you know, what could give them confidence to call on the Lord? Because he says his plans for his people are good. Verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So verse 11, it's probably one of the most well-known Bible passages around, and it's actually probably also one of the most commonly misunderstood that often goes hand in hand. Uh, we often you know, want to take this verse and we want to apply it to our lives individually and just sort of keep it in our, in our back pocket as if it's good to know that God is on my side personally and he's going to bring all my dreams to life or something like that. Nice to have that in your back pocket, but that's not the context. This isn't a promise to an individual, but the you is a people. God's people. He's reminding them that this exile, remember that's the context, which he delivered them into, 
has a purpose. They're not only participating in his purposes in the here and now, settling down, seeking shalom, but God's big plans for salvation are being worked out. They're not on hold. In fact, their exile was part of the plan. This exile would enable them to once again trust in him, the Lord who saves. It's, in the words of Chris Wright, the robust affirmation that even in and through the fires of judgment, there can be hope in the grace and goodness of God. We can stand firm because God's promises stand firm. Now, we know how that promise finds ultimate fulfilment. We know the one has already faced the full force of that judgment for us. For Jesus, he was exiled. (laughs) Jesus, by choice, came from heaven into our world and gave so completely that he gave us himself. Jesus gave so much of himself that even when we were enemies, he died for us. God paved a way through Jesus' death and resurrection for the ultimate shalom, for the perfect shalom, which we brought to completion for the entirety of creation when Jesus returns. And while we wait, we don't withdraw, we don't conform, but we settle down Seek shalom and stand firm. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for your extraordinary grace that abounds. We thank you for your love and your mercy that we see poured out in Jesus. And we thank you that you have placed us here to have a gospel presence that people might be pointed to you. Lord, we pray that especially this coming week that you really lay on our hearts the ways in which we can seek the welfare and the prosperity, the complete shalom of our city. Lord, we thank you for that huge privilege. Lord, please give us wisdom and boldness and the power of your spirit. Lord, please help us to demonstrate shalom even when it's uncomfortable for us, even when we don't want to, and even with those whom we find difficult. Lord, we also pray that by the power of your spirit, you might lay on our hearts the real desire and the insight to see the need of how we can truly pray for the welfare of our city. Lord, we thank you so much for the privileges to know you and to serve you and to proclaim you. Thank you that we can stand firm because your promises stand firm. In Jesus' name, amen.